Teaching is stressful. In fact, some studies show that teachers are the most stressed profession in the world. With increasing workload, meetings, accountability, and students with complex needs, teachers are struggling. And when teachers struggle, so do students. Teacher stress and burnout have been the focus of extensive research, identifying pressures in no particular order of high job demands, in other words, workload, poor working conditions, lack of autonomy, student misbehavior, poor relationships at work, and a poor school climate as the main contributors of teacher stress. Conversely, it's important to consider that teachers who experience warm classroom communities and have strong relationships at work credit this as a core reason for staying in the profession. But here's the problem. When people are chronically presented with stressors, even small things can trigger a stress response. When a student talks back or a colleague says something insensitive or another meeting is added to a teacher's already full calendar, it can trigger a fight response like yelling or being punitive with students or a flight response like checking out of meetings and daydreaming about retirement or freeze responses like becoming disconnected or unresponsive. Chronically stressed out or burned out teachers display a lack of flexibility and low frustration tolerance and the constant flow of cortisol into their system can create serious health problems. And on top of it all, one study measured cortisol level in elementary school students and their teachers and linked teacher stress to students' physiological stress regulation. It turned out that teachers who scored high on a teacher burnout rating scale had students with significantly higher cortisol levels. In other words, stress is contagious. The good news is that just as there is a neurobiology of stress, there's also a neurobiology of trust, relationships, and connection, which is mediated by a hormonal cascade called the oxytocin cascade, or the love hormone. One of the most important things about oxytocin is that it opposes cortisol. Relationships filled with trust are the antidote to the experience of stress. If we set up our schools to be filled with safe, supportive relationships, we can help repair and heal the stressed out brain of not only teachers, but students as well. And this is where restorative practices comes in. Restorative practices are a set of skills for building community and for responding to challenging behavior in schools. Restorative practices provide teachers with the tools that they need to address where the stress is coming from in the first place, specifically student misbehavior, poor relationships at work, and a poor school climate. In schools, the foundation of restorative practices are classroom circles, also called community circles. The class sits in a circle where they can see each other and take turns speaking about a topic. Maybe they're building community. Maybe there's a problem and they're expressing emotions and solving the conflict. Or maybe the teacher is using the circle to deliver academic instruction in a highly engaging way. In a circle, everyone has an opportunity to contribute and power is shared. A circle can be as short as 10 minutes or as long as the whole class period. It really depends on the purpose of the circle and the needs of the community. Another practice is affective language, both statements and questions that we can use to express how we're impacted by someone else's behavior without making them defensive because we're going to focus on needs instead of blame. Restorative chats are an informal facilitated conversation using the restorative questions to solve problems. Restorative mediation helps us resolve conflict between two people that's mutual with harm on both sides. Restorative circles, also called harm circles, help us respond to a problem when more people are involved and we want to hear what happened, who was affected, and how we need to repair the harm. Then there are restorative conferences, which are structured circles designed to respond to significantly disruptive or harmful incidents at school with those who did the harm and those who were harmed, as well as other people who were impacted. While schools who implement restorative practices tend to have very few out-of-school suspensions, when it does happen, we have re-entry circles when the student returns so that we can make a plan of support for them and their families. So why are restorative practices important? Why does it work? The primary research base for restorative practices is found in social bonding and the neurobiological components of creating trusting relationships. All of us are hardwired to connect with others, and in the same way that we need food and shelter, we also need deep and meaningful relationships. Consider Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. 
all day long, teachers are asked to meet self-actualization needs of students so that they meet their full potential. They can collaborate and be creative, yet so many underlying needs are just not met. We must have our basic physiological needs met, like food, shelter, and water, in order to learn. We also need to have safety needs met. We need to feel physically and emotionally secure at school, where there's order and predictability. And then we have belonging needs. And here's where circles come in. Circles improve relationships, and relationships matter. In a review of 46 educational research studies, they found that strong teacher-student relationships were associated with higher academic engagement, improved attendance, higher grades, and fewer disruptive behaviors. Fewer suspensions, lower school dropout rates, decrease in student and teacher anxiety, and an increase in student and teacher overall well-being. In other words, using circles can provide more time for learning, not less. So if we look back at our list of stressors for teachers, we can see how restorative practices reduces student misbehavior by creating a classroom community that helps students to understand and care about how their behavior impacts the people around them. And when issues arise, you can use a circle to help you solve problems and repair harm. I've known teachers who have held classroom circles to talk about lack of homework completion, bullying in the classroom, or lack of collaboration, so that they can hear what the students think the problem is and get their ideas on how to fix it. And restorative practices is not just for kids. It's also effective in the workplace to address poor or strained relationships at work. We know that the health of relationships among staff is a major contributor to teacher well-being. Using circles and staff meetings helps us build positive relationships and a sense of community. And when conflicts and tensions exist among adults in the workplace, especially if wrongdoing has occurred, restorative practices provides tools to resolve them so that people can work meaningfully and deeply with their colleagues to repair harm. Once I facilitated a circle for a school staff that could not even get through a staff meeting without someone walking out, yelling, or breaking down in tears. In our circle, we were able to share how each person was impacted by this behavior. Especially powerful were the new teachers, who until then had always been really quiet and kind of withdrawn. And when they shared how they didn't like going in the staff lounge and how they dreaded staff meetings because of all the negativity and the unkind behavior, the older teachers were shocked. It hadn't even occurred to them how their feuding made the new teachers feel. They were isolated and lonely. Together, they made some agreements about how they wanted to treat each other moving forward, and the school principal held them to these agreements, and relationships improved. Instead of toxic relationships filled with gossip, retaliation, sabotage, escalation of conflict, or withdrawal, Restorative practices help schools address issues directly and effectively so that people can heal and move forward. Using a restorative approach to address adult behavior at work can significantly reduce interpersonal stress, making teachers happier and more content at their schools, fostering a positive work culture, and ultimately bringing measurable gains for students. Restorative practices also addresses the major stressor of poor school climate. Research shows that classrooms in which teachers use restorative practices, like giving voice, facilitating circles, and reintegrating students into class after misbehavior, they reported much higher rates on school climate surveys. Students who experienced restorative practices in their classrooms had more positive feelings towards their teacher and peers, more voice and input, and an increased connectedness to the school. They had better peer friendships, developed more social skills, they were more empathetic and more assertive. Using restorative practices was even associated with lower rates of cyberbullying. Restorative practices also did some interesting things for equity. The number of days lost to suspension declined across the school, but even more so for low income and students of color. In other words, not only did restorative practices improve the school climate and relationships, but restorative practices significantly improved equity in the discipline of these schools and became a tool for inclusion. Restorative practices improves the school climate for students and staff because it provides meaningful ways to address misbehavior in schools, and it creates structure to build relationships and strengthen schools as communities. 
By implementing restorative practices, you'll significantly reduce stressors for teachers and schools. Student misbehavior, poor relationships, and school climate will all improve. And by extension, teachers may feel a lesser need for autonomy because their working relationships have improved. Other causes of stress, like workload and poor working conditions, they remain and they must still be addressed at the school and district level in collaborative ways. Self-care is really important, but it's not enough. We cannot self-care our way out of very real stressors that educators face every day. Teacher well-being is dependent upon forming healthy relationships with both their colleagues and their students. So we need to provide teachers with the tools to build community and to respond to conflict and tension in effective ways. Restorative practices increases trusting relationships, which neurologically speaking is an antidote to stress for both students and teachers and well-being improves. Go to my website, lauramoyman.com and download free resources, watch free training videos, check out my online courses and connect with me. Thanks.